Hey everyone, uh, so this is a new series I want to uh, try to do this year called The Weekly Pop, a reflective moment in pop culture. Uh, the series is primarily for my students, but I'm making it available to others uh, that might also find it interesting or enjoyable or, or just something worth sharing or, or thinking about. Um, so let's start with this clip. Fetch. All right, so before we go anywhere, maybe just pause right now and ask yourself, what are you seeing? Not literally, but what might be the connotations permeating in this scene? What elements may cause you to raise an eyebrow or, or think about what it is that, that you just witnessed? Um, so I want you to sit and think about that for a minute. Uh, maybe rewind and watch the scene again, but just pa hit pause and, and think about that. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, that was a clip from Season 2, Episode 3 from the TV show The Chronicles of Narnia. I almost said Chronicles of Narnia. Chronicles of Shannara. Uh, a TV show that airs on stations like MTV and Spike. Um, now, for those that don't know, the show uh, originated from a book series by Terry Brooks um, that was originally published or started to be published in the 1970s. Uh, the first of those books was The Sword of Shannara, uh, which is largely a ripoff of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was largely a, deliver a derivative work, uh, and while exciting, it didn't necessarily offer a lot of new ideas. Uh, but then Brooks comes out with the Elfstones of Shannara, and he begins to take the series in a whole new direction. In fact, over the next four decades, he crafts the world in this series into something very different uh, from Tolkien. I, I mean, of course, there's similarities. They both deal with magic. They both have numerous races, such as elves and gnomes and dwarves and humans. Uh, they both exist in worlds that seem very different from our own. Yet both series are, in many ways, about us, about humans, um, about the Earth, the actual Earth we're on. So while Tolkien and his stories are largely about Earth's past, Brooks's stories are about the future. Spoiler alert! Um, if you watch the TV show, that, that becomes very apparent. Uh, now, Brooks's stories tell us about a future where the modern world has been destroyed and eventually evolved into this fantastic world uh, of elves and gnomes, trolls and humans. Uh, of course, there's magic too. Uh, but by doing so, Brooks does something interesting with his series. Uh, he's dealing both with fantasy as a genre and to a certain degree post-apocalyptic uh, post fiction, right? So it's kind of both the, the, this mythical world, but also this, this future world where things have gone horribly astray. So that's all background uh, to just understanding what I'm about to talk about in this particular series in that particular scene. Uh, so it's a series that was born of a book of series, uh, of a, it's a series that was born from a book series uh, in the 1970s that was informed by the Lord of the Rings, but attempted to take uh, some of the central ideas and themes and reposition them into humanity's future uh, rather than our past. And that's all just to say, wow, so much of our fiction, be it, sci be it science fiction, fantasy, horror, whatever it is, uh, is really about us. Um, whether it's about worlds we may explore in those stories, it, it ultimately is about us. All right, so this week I was watching the second season of The Chronicles of Shannara on Netflix, of course. Uh, since I don't have cable, I generally watch most of my content on either Netflix, Amazon, or YouTube. Uh, and then also I borrow a lot of stuff from the library which you really should too. Uh, your local libraries are amazingly filled with all sorts of great materials, uh, DVDs, books, graphic novels, music, audiobooks, 
video streaming services. Like your libraries have all this great stuff. Um, and you can also tap into a, your larger library network that your library is connected to to get even more great stuff. Um, okay, my public service announcement. Uh, part of the video has been fulfilled. Obligatory shout out to my librarian peeps. Check. Back to season two. And so I'm making my way through it, uh, which is another thing to consider, right? We live in the age of binge watching, which means we can watch episode after episode after episode after, right? Now, Steven Johnson uh, has said that pop culture is making us smarter uh, and is famous in one of my favorite books, Everything Bad for You is Good. And I agree with him. Uh, but what's also made TV smarter is the ability to binge watch or just to rewatch, right? In the 1960s, where a show aired just once and was on, wasn't on demand, uh, or where entire episodes and seasons could be easily located on a streaming system, uh, it meant that it was hard to build up long, complex, and nuanced stories because. If people missed episodes, it would be hard to catch up. You may not see that episode again for months or years. Uh, so, you know, this is why things were more or less episodic, um, and you saw less of those seasonal arcs, so that kind of long, wine twisting story uh, that we see in some of the best series that, that we tend to think about. So, you know, a good example of this is Doctor Who, where uh, early on in Doctor Who, which has been around for over 50 years, which is crazy, um, it started with episodes or short runs of like two to four in a row, you know, two to four continuations. Um, but often now the seasons aim to kind of tell larger story arcs, right? So things that may cross over from episode to episode or season to season, right? They have these much longer things that go on. Um, and that is, you know, because we can slip back into previous episodes or easily catch up, uh, we can really enjoy more complex stories. Okay. I got distracted again with this tangent, um, but I'm serious. This time, uh, I'm going to talk about season two of Chronicles of Shannara. Uh, so I'm a few episodes in, and they introduce a character named Gareth Jax. Uh, he's a smart and distinguished bounty hunter with, of course, you know, a past. Uh, now, Jax is played by Gentry White, uh, African-American. Now, within the TV series, that's not particularly surprising. Uh, it's filled with an increasingly uh, racially diverse cast with many non-white actors uh, and actresses, and many characters are often of ambiguous, uh, uh, amb ambiguous in their race. Uh, this, of course, is quite different from the original book series because fantasy as a whole... Uh, has been dominated by white men telling stories about white saviors. Uh, there's really no other way to put it. Um, that's not to say the mold isn't being broken. It, it certainly is. But really, from Lord of the Rings to Brooks's series to The Wheel of Time to The Sword of Truth to Dragonlance to Belgariad, um, it's hard to argue otherwise. Thus, the fact that the producers made a conscious effort to change the racial makeup of the story acknowledges a very white past. And that whiteness is not just bound up in storytelling around fantasy, but, you know, really much of popular culture in the, US, in the history of the U.S. So, in that way, fantasy is fascinating to study in that it's been predominantly white men fantasizing about magical worlds where humans clash with other races of humanoids, right? So your elves, your gnomes, your dwarves, etc. Uh, and their white protagonists are able to win the day while any sense of non-white folks among those humanoids um, in these worlds, it's almost non-existent. Uh, so in some ways, it's a wash in white supremacist ideology. I know we don't like to really think about that. Um, and it always, you know, th there's a part of me that's troubled when, when I think or when I read fantasy and, and that, that becomes evident. Um, but really, so much of fantasy is this idea of the white humans will vanquish the evil races and rule the world in a good and proper way. Uh, take a look at a lot of, a lot of fantasy, and, and that is the driving theme. So just kind of... Sit with that. Um, 
So back to the episode, right? The thing that I'm here to talk about. Uh, we're introduced to Jax uh, in a future world of Earth where other types of races dominate what we would call racial tension. Uh, humans and elves and gnomes barely get along, and it's clear that there's animosity among them. You largely get the sense that racism of yesterday, or what is today, is gone, and Jax's blackness should not matter. But hold that thought, right? Think back to that scene. Okay, to give you some background of the scene that, that we, we started the video with, um, Jax joins with the protagonist to execute a plot wherein he brings uh, one, of the you know, one of the protagonists in as a prisoner to these bad guys. Uh, they're called the Crimson, uh, a group of elves who are trying to eradicate magic. We're not getting into that, but that in itself has all sorts of interesting connotations. Um, he arrives at the, the Crimson's fortress with the prisoner. There's some debate about whether to pay him or not, but finally the head of the guards, that, that blonde-haired elf, uh, takes a bag of money that he owes Jack and throws it behind him. He says, in really condescendingly, one simple word. Fetch. Now... In the U.S. and in many places around the world, when a person of white skin tells a person of African descent to fetch, your ears should perk up because it's not a neutral term. Fetch is what we play with dogs. Fetch is a command. Fetch has the connotation of a master-servant relationship. It calls up the substantial history of the dominance and exploitation of African, uh, Africans as a whole and within U.S. culture, African Americans by white Americans throughout the last four centuries. So what does this mean? It can mean many things depending on where you put your emphasis. You can look at it blindly and just say... That is merely how the elves would speak to humans and, or how fanaticals would speak to mercenaries, right? Because fanaticals and, and mercenaries are, are often antithetical uh, people in many ways. They, you know, one is passionate and doesn't need to be paid. They are just so wrapped up in their cause and the other will only do something if you pay them. So, so you can't take that. Um, that makes sense within the story, but the pop culture scholar is likely to read read that differently. Uh, the dialogue created is not neutral. Writers working away at developing each scene and thinking about its relevance, right? That's not neutral. They are informed by the culture and the world in which they live. Therefore, the writers made a choice on that word, and one has to wonder what informed it. Was it informed by a diverse or a diverse-minded staff that thought that to make this scene feel differently, they would add that word? Was it a decision not consciously considered, but felt obvious to the writers once they knew Jax would be black? Uh, in using fetch, were the writers, intentional or otherwise, invoking the caricature, the caricatured African-American persona of step and fetch it, a trickster and lazy stereotype that's been used over the course of the 20th century, you know, you could say in the 19th century and, and even in the present, but were they somehow, whether they knew it or not, invoking that, that dynamic? Um, could, you know, could by using it, could they be hinting that indeed racial tension and white supremacy as we know it today has not somehow disappeared in the future? The, there are interesting questions to consider and think about and brings me back to the key point about studying popular culture. There are many ways to study it, but one way that we get some of the richest understandings is by looking at the context, right? The times, the histories, the other influential factors, the limitations, the codes, the morals, etc., cetera, um, of, the you know, of that place and time it's created uh, in intersecting that with the connotation, that is, understanding that there are the straightforward meanings in the real meanings behind things. We demarcate the, the, the denotation, right, the given meaning, and the connotation, the, the implied meaning, all the time, right? We do this all the time. This is something we, we 
as humans are constantly doing every day. Don't believe me? Think about the last time you or somebody you knew said, I'm fine. Now, the denotation, right, the given meaning, tells us that the person is fine. The connotation tells us that the speaker is anything but fine. In fact, if somebody says that to you and you believe them, don't be surprised if the next time you interact with them, they're really pissed because I'm fine often does not tell us that the person is fine. All right, so that was quite the meandering path, right? Um, just to talk about that 20 second scene within a TV series, I went into a history of epic fantasy, delved into the considerations about adaptation, discussed racial depictions and fantasy, considered the complexity of modern television, uh, and raised some questions about how such scenes are composed by thinking about writers, denotation, and connotation. And that's why I love pop culture. Uh, there's just so much to talk about. All right, so that's it for this week's insight into pop culture. Um, what about you? Did you have any interesting thoughts about it? Did you have any interesting moments or, or things that you witnessed or experienced that kind of raised your, you know, gave you something to think about that, that you want to kind of explore? Uh, let me know. Just uh, respond to me. You can post in the comments. You can reply. Shoot me an email. Shoot me a, a tweet. Whatever you want. Uh, I'd love to hear it from you. Thanks.